Uh, my name is Frank Licata. Uh, up until recently, I was the operations manager at Man Lake in uh, Pennsylvania. I've kind of gone into semi-retirement doing things like this. And um, I'm a Pennsylvania beekeeper as well. I run 140 colonies. And I've actually started going to single deeps. A couple of reasons why. One of the things I discovered as I came out of winter into my dead outs was I'd have a double deep and each one of those deeps would have at least two full frames of honey on the outside, each outside, and on the top. Well, if a, a deep frame is gonna weigh about what, five pounds or so maybe? <laughs> Right? So you're talking about 40 pounds of honey that is now crystallized, is no good to me, and all I'm doing is feeding it back to the bees. And if we think back about nutrition and feed for bees, honey for bees doesn't let them make uh, wax, does not let them raise brood, it just keeps them alive. I'm better off feeding them sugar water when I need to feed them. So I decided to go to single deeps, and there's a process to it. Now, one of the side benefits of running a single deep is the weight as well. I look around this room, I see a lot of gray hair like I have, and we're getting older and not as strong as we used to be. Having to lift that, that deep on top to get to that bottom brood box is a lot of work. Most of us work alone or with one other person. So that side benefit of making it easier to do our bee work lets us get into that bee yard more and do the things we need to be doing. And it trickles all the way down to treating for mites. Now we don't have to worry about treating two deeps for when it comes to mite treatments, maybe we're only doing one deep. So how do we go about getting into a single deep? Well, if you come into spring with an overwintered colony and it's already in two deeps, it's easy. We let them get established a little while. We do our split. Maybe in our box we split without the queen. We put a caged queen in there and get them going or if we're already coming into spring with just a deep, one deep. How do we do this? Well, the first thing I do in mine is I want to go into that, that hive and I want to analyze that colony. I don't want to waste time on a weak colony. So I'm going to make sure I've got a good queen in here. You know, she's laying, she's already starting to get a good pattern in there. I'm going to look at the health of those honeybees, make sure that colony looks nice. It's going to take off nice. And then I'm probably going to start feeding a, a syrup a sugar syrup. Now when I say sugar syrup, we all know, we've talked about the different sugars that bees consume. We want to feed them sucrose. Nectar, table sugar, compound sugar. That stimulates that queen to lay a lot of eggs, stimulates the wax glands on the worker bees, right? That's what we want to feed them. If we feed them honey, we just put honey frames in there, they're not going to do either of those things. They're going to need nectar to do that. Honey is basically to keep our bees alive in the winter time, put fat bodies on them, store honey in the hive. So we want to feed them sugar water to get them kicked off. Maybe we need to feed them a pollen substitute if there's no real pollen available. But um, from my experience, by the time these bees are starting to go, there's enough pollen coming in. We do not need to feed them that pollen substitute. So we're going to end up with a configuration like this, if we have our single deep. So is that all we need to do? Absolutely not, because this situation right here, our hive is going to swarm on us. There's just not enough room in here in the springtime for them to bring in. They're gonna be bringing in a lot of open wet nectar. They're gonna be bringing in a lot of pollen. That queen is gonna be laying a lot of brood in there. It's quickly gonna get very congested in here. So we want to get rid of that feeling of congestion so they don't try to swarm on us. And this is where we say we're running a single deep for honey production, but we're kind of not really. There's a short period of time where we're not running a single deep. And here's how I do it. I'll take and add, in my case, I'll add a medium super of drawn comb. Okay, don't put foundation in there, put drawn comb in there. I've got no queen excluder on here and I'm gonna put my lid back on here. So I've given, I've expanded the space for them to expand that brood nest, right? The, the comb I use in here, generally if, yeah, if you've kept bees for a while, right, your honey supers, that comb generally stays clean for a lot of years. It doesn't really get dark like our brood comb does. But occasionally we've had the queen go up in our honey supers and lay, so it 
gets a little dark in there. I keep those frames separate and I use them for this box. They've been used. The queen likes frames that are used. So I use these in this box. And I let this colony expand as I'm getting closer to my honey flow. Now, as we come into the honey flow, I've got now got brood down here. I've got brood up here as well, maybe some pollen. And so they've expanded up there. My honey flow is going to start in earnest. Once a honey flow starts, our bees don't want to swarm at that point. They're busy bringing in nectar and making honey. If you, if you think about it, when your colony swarms, it usually swarms maybe right in the beginning of the honey flow. But they started that prep weeks ago. They knew back then. Well, by doing this, we've kind of eliminated that swarm pressure, hopefully. Now, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to break this down to a single deep for my honey. How do I do that? I've got to get the queen out of here. Now, there are multiple ways. We, you know, we can go through each frame, make sure she's not in there. We could shake the bees off. We could use something like a fume board. If anybody's used fume boards before, you spray it with something the bees, a scent the bees do not like, and we could put it on top of here for a few minutes. We come back, this is basically empty. I'll pull it off, and I may still look at the frames just to make sure that queen is not there. But we get the bees out of that super. We're gonna remove it. We're gonna take and add a queen excluder. And we're gonna put it back on. Now, this is where, you know, I always say, we go back to our biology of honeybees, because people say, well, now you've got brood up in your honey supers. Down here, I believe, your honey flow is approximately six to eight weeks, is that true? Something like that? Mine up north is a good six weeks anyway. We know that for a honeybee, egg to emerging is 21 days, drone 24 days. Well, if you've done this, maybe the first or second week of your honey flow, when it's coming in good, you do this, 21 days later, 24, there's gonna be no brood in here. Now, when I do this, I obviously stack more honey supers on top of here, but all the brood will be gone out of this. And so they'll fill this. So we come in through the honey flow and we just add our supers and we let them fill it up. As you can see in the picture, that's how we started and then we moved it. Now, when we, when we come into our honey dearth, right at the end of the flow, we're gonna remove our honey supers. And this is probably where down here you may have to do it a little differently than I have to do it up north I'll remove all my supers, and I will go back to that single deep. Bees in a dearth are not generally going to swarm. They need incoming nectar, all of that. When there is a dearth and I've got no nectar coming in, that brood nest starts to shrink. So that swarm pressure is off. As long as I don't overfeed them, I will generally give them a little bit of sugar syrup, possibly, to keep them raising some brood. But for the most part, I can run most of the season like this. And I was a little skeptical when I started doing this, thinking, how is this going to work? You know, and I'm used to having, you know, five to six frames in the middle here filled with brood, and I've got honey on the outside and all of that. When I went in and inspected this box, it was wall-to-wall -wall brood, all brood. There was almost no honey down there, no nectar. Well, the bees are, they know. They move it up, they bring it back down when they need it. And it seems actually kind of more economical for them. They make the best use of this box for their brood. And it's worked out well. So we get through the season. Now in the fall, do you have a, you have a fall flow down here, I assume? You've probably got two options. One option is you could put a, a second deep on here, let them expand into it. That, come the next spring, gives you the option to split that colony. Or you can go into winter just like this but you've got to keep them fed. You got to make sure they have enough in there. Uh, up in the Northeast, we get a long cold winter. I cannot feed liquid syrup through the winter time. I've got to get enough on them when I put them away for the winter time. And there's a couple of ways we can feed our bees. One of them is with um, a sugar-based candy boards or fondant or something like that. I like to, uh, I take my old boxes when they get old and ratty and I'll rip them on the table saw and I'll make shims like this. So I can put them on top of my colony and I've got a spacer underneath here, space where I can lay, you know, 
fondant patties, winter patties, dry sugar on cardboard, anything like that. So that'll get me through winter that way. But before I go into winter with them, I want to make sure that as this brood nest contracted, that I backfilled all those open cells with honey, right? Now, when we make a syrup for our bees, you hear people say, oh, one to one sugar, two to one sugar, all that stuff it does not matter in the springtime. We've got a lot of time. In the winter, I would say we're on the clock when we're in the fall. We're getting those shorter, cooler days. The bees have to dry that down to 18.5%, right, and cap it for the winter time. So you, you want to feed as thick of a syrup as you can. So if you're feeding a sugar syrup in the fall, you want to make it as thick as you can. Personally, I feed a commercial syrup. Um, this one happens to be the one that Man Lake makes. It's 77% solids, so it's very low in moisture. The bees don't have to dry that down as much. And I'll go down my colonies, and I bucket feed for, uh, for efficiency for me mostly. I drill a hole in the top of this lid, and I'll fill this with a heavy, heavy, thick syrup, put it on here, and let the bees take it. They can get to it 24 hours a day pretty much. Doesn't matter if it's dark, light, raining, cold. They can get to that and fill it up. And I'll check them every once in a while to make sure they're putting weight on that colony because I want that colony filled. Once we get past, in the, up in the Northeast, once I get past September, beginning of September, my bees are not going to swarm. I don't have to worry about you know, feeding them too much and causing them to swarm. Down here it's a little different. And now because your winters are much shorter and much warmer, you can easily do this, right? You could feed probably liquid. Some of you could probably tell me how often, you know, how late in the season you could feed a liquid feed. So this should be really easy. And like uh, I had said when I started this, the, the main goal of this is maximi maximizing my honey production. I can average hmm, 60 pounds or so of honey off of my colonies. When I switched to this, I went right up to 100 pounds. And I, I, at first I had to think about it. Was it just a better year? Was it, you know, what was it? And then I realized it was just, I had those frames that typically were, the bees were turning in, you know, putting honey in. Now they weren't, it was all upstairs. And when we do this, a lot of us are doing this, we're selling our honey, we know this is not a cheap hobby. So what is, what's economically the better decision? Take all the honey you can, that you're gonna sell at eight to $10 a pound, and then turning around and feeding them sugar water, where sugar costs you, what, 50, 60 cents a pound. You know, $8, eight to $10 versus 60 cents, I'll take the $8 every day of the week. So it's an economical thing too. And it'll just, I, I believe, it'll make you uh, a better beekeeper as far as getting in your colonies more often. We all look at our colonies and go, oh, I gotta get into my colony today. You know, you're more apt to say, I don't have to lift that deep. I can go in there, work my bees, and it's just a, a much, much easier way to run your bees. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's actually very, very simple. At the end, usually during my dearth between my spring and my fall flow, I do go in there and do a few things. You know, I, I monitor, I take that opportunity to monitor and treat for mites. I'm, a, I'm an apigar guy, apivar guy. I like apivar for mite treatments. Apivar is a 42 to 54 day treatment. So when I pulled my supers, my flow ends July 4th. I take my supers off. As I take them off, I'm going in here. I'm putting my Apivar strips in here. My next flow does not start until the third to fourth week of August. And normally you need two strips per brood box. Anybody that's used Apivar knows it's not a cheap treatment. Now I've gone from spending four strips per colony down to two. So it's an economical advantage as well. So you got to think about all these things and think about what your goals are in your beekeeping. If you don't care about honey, you don't, you don't have to do this. But we all should be thinking about how to do it economically because this, this hobby is not going to get any cheaper as we go along. And we all want to probably make some honey, sell some honey. This is just a much easier option in my opinion. And like I said, the fall flow, we're just going to feed them up. Make sure they're fed up before we put them away for the winter. And then winterize. I think um, you guys are lucky, you know, your winterizing is probably nowhere near our winterizing. We have to worry about moisture. I'm sure maybe you guys don't even have to worry about mice. We have to worry about the mice getting in there. Um, we, 
sometimes my colonies, I, I have trouble finding them in the snow. I don't think you've ever had that down here. So, but, um, and actually this year I'm actually, since I've gone to single deeps, another thing I'm going to do this year is I'm going to try to overwinter them in a building. I'm working on that now. There's a process out there how to do it. And that's even going to make it better for me. Rather than leaving all my colonies out there in the cold, I can shelter them in a building, you know, temperature uh, and air control in there and see how they work out. And who knows, maybe they'll come out so strong in the spring I can split them a little earlier than I normally do. That's pretty much all there is for that.